This is on Nomi, a great new idea out of Japan, online drinks with your friends when you can't be with them in person. Cheers. Hello again, it's Andy from Precision Hydration. I'm back with another um, on Nomi, online drinks. I've got my McCafe early morning coffee here this morning now that our little drive through down the road is opened and I'm having a drink today with Emma Jeffco and it's a bit later in the day for you in Oz, isn't it Emma? Yeah it is, it's uh, quarter to seven at night and I'm enjoying a nice sparkling water with some wine. Yeah, uh, tossing nice. up whether to tossing up whether to have a red wine but uh, we got a pretty, pretty big training day on the Saturday so we'll leave that for Saturday night. Uh, yeah good idea. What training have you been up to today? Uh, we actually do a recovery Friday, so it's quite nice kind of before a big weekend of training. So we just uh, do a gym session, a nice light swim, and then a 30-minute run, so pretty easy. Yeah. Okay, nice and cruisy today then. Very nice Feeling before good. the weekend. Excellent. Um, so people will, people will know you as a you know, professional triathlete. You've won three, I believe it's three ITU World Cups in recent years gunning for the Olympic Games this year, which obviously now hasn't happened. So what what else should people know about Emma Jeffcoat, though, if not if not just to, as a triathlete? Yeah, there's a bit more to Emma Jeffcoat than um, the triathlon world. Uh, I'm also a registered nurse. I was a former surf lifesaver on the Sydney Northern Beaches, which I call home. And I'm a adamant horse lover. So I've had my horse Cherokee for close to 15 years now. So I guess, yeah, they're pretty big aspects of my life. And um, yeah, a definite other side to the triathlete. Absolutely. Now, one of those that's quite related to triathlon in many ways is the surf lifesaving. And that's an area that fascinates me because although I grew up in the UK in Leicestershire, which is in the Midlands, which is as literally as far from the coast as you can get in the UK, late, later on, I got into a sport called surf ski paddling, which has its origins in, in surf lifesaving. And I've, I've done quite a few surf ski races around the world now and really got into it. And that's got me into that community a little bit but for people that yeah. don't really know the competitive because you know, the competitive sport of surf lifesaving what kind of um, events and activities does that involve yeah i mean in australia it's absolutely huge i think in terms of ratios of who kind of kids that grow up doing triathlon to kids that grow up doing surf lifesaving it would be you know 10 to 1 there's so many kids that just grow up doing nippers um and kind of nippers is how you get into i guess surf lifesaving uh competitively later on mm -hmm. um so nippers you'll race over like a sprint a soft sand sprint a swim race and a board race and then as you get older through the years i think once you're probably like 14 15 they start introducing that surf ski which is what you found yourself into and um yep. yeah i guess if you pre kind of go through the ranks once you're uh 15 you then can go to aussies which is like our famous national titles um and it's absolutely huge. You just, you have, um, again, you race over the swim, the board, the ski, Ironman. So that's swim, board, yep. and ski. And then they got other events like 2K run, the soft sand run, yep. uh, which is a, a soft spot of mine. And then all the team stuff. So you'd kind of just mix, you'd have swim teams, ski relays, board relays, a taplin, which is like one person does a swim, one does the board, one does a ski. So, yeah, I, I grew up doing that literally until I jumped over to try probably it would have been maybe 20 or 21. And I literally left school and told my parents I want to be a professional athlete. And I thought that was going to mean surf lifesaving. And I guess kind of in those two early years after leaving school, got a bit more of pers a perspective in terms of yeah. what would have been, I guess, what what kind of that potential looks like and surf lifesaving it although it's huge in Australia it doesn't really offer the ability to be I guess a professional um, livelihood internationally so yeah I made that yeah. decision to jump to try yeah it's definitely not got that full international flavor has it it's um it's sort of it's I think South Africa you would say surf life is pretty big mm. and on Australia but outside of that it's kind of little pockets here and there yeah, and I mean, like, for example, I, w I went to the World Champs for Surf Lifesaving in, like, 2018 and won the 2K Soft Sand Run. 
Yeah. And everyone thought I was this amazing runner. I jumped a triathlon and I just got left behind. Like, yeah. so it kind of gives you a bit of perspective. But, but yeah, it's, it's huge down here. But I think it's fair to say one thing that um, surf lifesaving competitors generally bring to triathlon is a pretty handy swim leg because yeah, the swim the swimming in that sport is flat out isn't it and it's in rough oh. water and it's very physical it's jostling yeah. around the swim boys and all that kind of stuff it always when you watch it on tv it looks brutal it, it is honestly insane and i think because we race like it's 400 meters and genuinely everyone that does surf club because it's much like it's a water-based sport and i mean those to their credit those guys train you know five six times in the pool and then plus the board and plus the ski. So they're very strong in the water. And um, you get, yeah, you have 30 in a swim race. And to get to the final um, of an Aussie swim race, you'd have to go through heats, um, quarterfinals, semifinals to make a final kind of thing. So you're talking about starting with like 200 girls and getting down to your top 30. So yeah, it's, it's, it's insane. So, but I mean, then coming across to triathlon, it, it, um, it makes you very prepared to get in the, uh, the old ITU swims. Yeah, yeah, find some feet and, and jostle your way around those is, is not so, yeah. so, so bad. <laughs> those those boys aren't as daunting. No, that's for sure. Um, changing gears a little bit, Emma, I listened to a, a, a podcast that you recorded recently, which gave us a really interesting insight into your background. Um, and I don't know whether it – so you've studied nursing, as you said, and you've yeah. got a degree in that. Um, and was it something to do with your – your past you know your your past with them um, near-death experiences as a youngster that kind of got you interested in that field yeah definitely was I think that's I always knew I wanted to work somewhere in the medical field ever since well my, what I can remember um yeah. and kind of my earliest memories literally came from hospital so yeah it's pretty directly linked when I was uh three a bit three and a half I think I got misdiagnosed with gastro and pneumonia, um, which is pretty bad to have for yeah. a, a three-year-old anyway. But um, I actually had uh, acute appendicitis and then I got sent home from hospital um, and mum took me back to the hospital and knew that something wasn't quite right. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it was actually like a junior doctor that kind of told my mum, you know, if I was you, I'd take, you know, I would get your daughter transferred to a more um, – acute children's hospital and get some more answers because I don't think, I don't think they've got the full picture here. So I ended up Mm. getting transferred to the major children's hospital in Sydney and um, my appendix ruptured on the Wednesday and they actually didn't, uh, the doctors didn't discover that until the following Monday. So yeah, there was about like a kind of a five day window there that if you can imagine like a little three-year-old with a ruptured appendix, a lot can happen in that five days. And I literally just, um, you know, by the time they ended up discovering what was actually wrong, I was in organ failure and septic and oh. pretty much, pretty much dead. So I, the last thing mum saw was them running me in a hospital bed after a um, CT scan when they x-rayed my stomach and they just saw a huge black cloud and there was nothing to be seen. And, um, yeah, the last thing she saw was that them literally running with the hospital bed to into surgery and didn't even get consent. Um, so I think that kind of shows you this day and age uh, how bad it was, I guess. Yeah. And then, yeah, I guess, as a result, um, spent the next six months in ICU uh, with a complete uh, bowel obstruction and then rupture. Um, so they kind of had to remove parts slowly, um, repair and then remove parts of my bowel and in small intestine and yeah I think I think it was four months before I ate a single piece of food and yeah months on end before I kind of came around and yeah came out of a coma so it was pretty insane yeah yeah that's a hell of a story and and has it you know what's amazing is obviously you're competing at the very highest level in one of the hardest sports in the world now is there any is there any sort of residual physical effects from all of that trauma no, I th- I think I'm so blessed, and I think that's along the lines of why I got so into so why I wanted to do nursing, um, a hundred percent, and why I think I fell into sport as well because I went through so many years of just being unhappy with the way, you know, my body was, and um, yeah, I guess growing up I had problems with my um, stomach and 
like those functions. But I think it was only when I went through my teens and kind of found sport and found an outlet that I could be good at that I started kind of appreciating what my body could do. Um, yeah. And I've got to be so thankful in the fact that I've got no long-term effects now apart from a few scars. So, yeah, very, very lucky. Absolutely, yeah. And I think, like you said, what's amazing when you when you dig under the surface is how many of these kind of stories are out there because I can relate to your story. Not, not so much personally, for, not for me, but my daughter was born three years ago and everything was normal and fine and then she was born and then we had this sort of like amazing panic for um week long thing where she she had problems with her um respiration we were immediately into icu and she was in a she was put into a medically induced coma and it was like incredible and seeing how mm. seeing that that system kick in and and take care of her and you know, she's thankfully made a complete and full recovery and is totally healthy and happy now but it's amazing how quickly those things can turn and then like the appreciation that gives you for the the medical community and what they can do it was you know unbelievable what we what we saw happen so i can yeah. understand why that would want you to get involved in it you know as a do you see that as being a career move for you after after sport do you think you'll it, pursue yeah 100 percent. and even i think it's just i have so much appreciation for the work they do and, and almost want to get involved myself to be able to give back and i mean the nurses still to this day um i still get letters off the doctor that you know, made the wrong call and then realised, you know, five days later that he'd been telling my mum that there's nothing wrong with your child when really he'd made the mistake kind of thing. So, you know, and I still get letters from him and I'm still in contact with the nurses that looked after me to the point where when I went back on prac, you know, 18 years later, I didn't even have to say my name and they recognised me and they were still working in the children's hospital. So it's yeah. kind of those stories that you're just so grateful and you just, well, for me, I just want to be able to get involved with that and give back. And it's 100%. I'm kind of excited. Um, I guess for, I'm, I'm definitely not anywhere near looking at the end of triathlon yet. I've still got so much more I want to achieve and do in the sport, but it's exciting to think after the sport where where that where that career could take me as well. Definitely, and it's I think it's quite unusual based on a lot of the athletes that I've talked to to see someone who's got quite a clear vision of where they want to go after sport. Because when you're focusing 100 percent on you know your athletic career, it is kind of all consuming, and it's quite tempting and quite easy probably to put that to one mm. put everything else on the side and think I'll deal with that later. So that's pretty cool that you've got a you've got that that idea that idea mapped out just a few medals and podiums to tick off before then probably hopefully a few olympic games to get to before then is that is it the olympic games that is the big inspiration for you as an athlete do you think yeah definitely i mean at this present minute in the itu realm it's like kind of the pinnacle in our sport and and getting a medal at those games, whether that be, you know, kind of striving an individual for the mixed team relay now, which yeah. uh, will, will debut in Tokyo. That's the massive goal and the kind of the dangling prize in front. But, um, yeah, I mean, I still know I've got so much more to offer in the World Triathlon Series itself. And beyond that, I think I would really love to have, have a crack at some half Ironmans and, yeah, who knows, maybe, maybe give the full – Full one a crack one day. Yeah, move up the distances a bit. You've also you also seem to have taken well to the Super League style of racing. That because that to me yeah. has sort sort of has elements with the elimination heats and the the feel. It sort of feels a little bit surf life saving as well. Yeah, Do you think that's why you have adapted well to that. Yeah, hundred percent. I just love it. I think it, Super League so dynamic and ever changing. I mean, just when you think you got it down. And Pat, then they change the order and you're not doing swim, bike, run, you're running, swimming and then riding. Um, and I think that's really similar and familiar to me growing up doing surf club because, I mean, you'd be on the start line and then they'd pull out of a hat what order you're racing, your, you know, your Australian Championship Ironman final in. And you've got, you know, 60 seconds to be like, okay, so I'm going ski, then swim, then board. And then, you know, the next race following, they'll draw it out of the hat and it'll be different again. So I think it just makes you adaptable and you kind of just learn to to think on your feet. And I love that about Super League. I think it makes it so so fun to watch as a spectator as well and, and fun to yeah. compete in. 
yeah, it's definitely done that. I think there's, it's pulled people into to watching the sport and it because it brings a bit of intrigue with it and a bit of excitement as well. And I guess that's what they're trying to do as well with the mixed relay and that kind of thing at the Olympics mm. is, is try and make it more more spectator friendly. Yeah, and I think they're already talking for Paris to hopefully bring in a Super League style race um, as a kind of third medal potential. Um, I think it's something like the Eliminator format too. So I, okay. I don't know how the deep the details of it, but I think yeah, Super League's definitely changed the game there. And if, if they're talking about another medal for triathlon at the future Olympics, that's great for the sport. Yeah, it's brought some definitely bringing some fresh ideas. Now, it's a bit, it probably becomes a bit of a cliched question at this point because we're we're recording this in July and um, the, the sort of COVID-19 coronavirus situation has been rumbling on for a few months now. And what it's done is it's it's made it very unclear when athletes will be able to race again. So how have you managed to... What's your, been, been your mental process for sort of training in the last few months when it's been kind of... I want to say I don't want to say completely aimless because the the goals are still there further down the line. Yeah. But certainly, the short term markers have been taken away. How have you approached that? Yeah, definitely. I think the big one for me um, was getting home and back to my uh, home environment. So I'm surrounded by family, friends, um, and I think as I mentioned earlier, pets like my horse. I yeah. think honestly, things like that for me make the hugest difference. So. I, when I, I know for me personally, when I'm happy uh, and settled in an environment, that's when I train best and then perform best. And so although we're not getting the chance to perform, I'm certainly in an environment that's setting me up to train um, the best that I can be and, and be motivated to, to do those sessions, um, knowing that at the end of the day, I'm surrounded by family and friends and not kind of away from that and living kind of away from home in an unfamiliar environment. So I think I'm kind of trying to make sure I enjoy this crazy period and um, yeah I mean it's been so long as I mentioned since um, we've had this long in one place I guess so yeah, I guess taking advantage of that and whether that means every few weeks I just call the coach up and say look I had a day off I'm, I'm not up to doing the session today I'm just mentally not there um, yeah, we're kind of just working on that week by week. Yeah, yeah, small steps, taking it one bit at a time. Yeah, and break it down. Yeah, yeah, because it, I think when the difficulty that I that I'm probably personally struggling with and see with a lot of other people struggling with as well is that this is one of those situations where we don't we don't know where the end is or what the end looks like. You know, it's kind of as an athlete, if you've got to go out and run 10k as fast as you can if it's on a track, you know how many laps you can tick them off and you can kind of, you can meet your, your output, can't you, to that end goal. Whereas at the yeah. moment, we're all kind of going along and thinking, well, what's sustainable? How long have we got to do this for? What's it going to mean? And because there's been a lot of temptation at this point, I think, for people to start talking about, oh, well, 2020 has been bad, but, but it'll all be, it's all going to yeah. be better in 2021. But we all probably deep down should realise and know that, nothing magic is going to happen between the 31st of December and the 1st of January. So what does that, what does that look like? And what we've been working on in the business is, is sort of trying to, trying to transcend that thinking more recently and look at, look at this as like, okay, well, we'll, we'll actually look way shorter term while keeping the eyes on the prize in the long term. It's about what can you do this week, next week that, yeah. that, get, that puts you in the right direction for where you want to go, but isn't necessarily sort of, committing to something that you might be disappointed about and it's been yeah, a really, really tough phase a hundred percent I think that's kind of been a massive one um for me personally just I think triathletes that's the kind of the people we are we're kind of that type mm. a personality that you do just love getting a session done and, and doing it well and ticking it off okay next one okay and then in, in two weeks time I've got this race and you just move on one thing to the next and you're so focused um, and getting all that work done that I think for me personally, it's been about setting goals within training and look at other things that I can kind of use this time to improve on so that I'm still getting that um, feed, that positive feedback and that outlook to, to know that I'm still improving towards that goal. And whenever that goal will be, I know that I'm, you know, have done what I can in this period to be the best, best that I can be when, when the opportunity arises to race again. 
what's what's the um, thing that you've managed to work on or had the most success improving in the last few months? I've been working really hard on my um, bike in terms of my kind of that middle ground. Um, we did a bit of testing and looking back at race feedback and kind of found some weaknesses there. So we've been working really hard to kind of improve that functional threshold over that kind of 20 to 40 minute time period. Yeah. So, and we've seen some really great improvements over that. So it's been those kind of goals when you see the work you're doing um, kind of giving you the definite steps forward and improvements. I think that really helps to keep tapping away. Yeah, that's a really good, the, the old um, threshold improvement is a really good one to mm. be working on at the moment isn't it because it's so measurable it's so easy to do that on a trainer and just kind of get yeah. the numbers out you don't need certain courses or anything it's just like a it's an incremental exercise you can push forward so literally yeah, me one. and the trainer yeah <laughs> spent some quality time together what is your what is your trainer of choice what do you use i've got the tax the neo 2 yeah and are you a, are you a zwifter or do you, use do you know a, what i'm not a massive zwifter i actually use the tax um app the training yeah. app, I find, I find really brilliant. I like the kind of GPS 3D um, visual videos that you follow on the courses and, yeah, the ability to kind of make my own um, session up and then have that transfer onto a video or literally ride, you know, through the Pyrenees in Spain and get, you know, 2,000 metres elevation gain. So, yeah. yeah, that's been really useful. Cool. And wrapping this up, Emma, because I know it's getting late on your end, um, you, you probably need to get your, your sleep in for a big session tomorrow. What What is the training plan tomorrow? Have you got a big Saturday planned? Yeah, so Saturday's training is we ride first. We've got a three-hour ride, and then within that ride, I've got five times 10-minute um, hill effort. So at, I guess, like um, whatever I can hold best average for those five 10 minutes, And then... We've got a 10K run, just cruisy run. Yeah. And then in the afternoon, we've got a 4K sprint swim set. So I don't know what the exact swim set is, but last week that involved 20 50s max um, with Oof. some kind of tempo swimming. Yeah, breaking them up a bit. But yeah, they yeah. stung. Yeah. So well, that sounds like a good way to spend your Saturday. And then it, <laughs> crack open the red wine by about exactly. 6 p.m. Yeah. <laughs> And then early night. Fantastic. Well, I yeah. hope that goes well. Um, Thank thanks you. very much. Thanks very much for sparing your evening to have a chat with us. And hopefully it won't be too long before we see some more photos of you on a, on a podium somewhere. Thanks, guys. It's been a pleasure. Cheers, Cheers. Emma. Bye-bye.